morning and welcome August Gate Church. Please stand with me as we prepare to worship Jesus together. Before we begin singing, I'd like to read a section from Psalm 46 in order to prepare our hearts to, to worship him. Starting in verse 1, it says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Church, this morning we have the opportunity to celebrate and remember Reformation Day, which is a movement began over 500 years ago with Martin Luther. And during that movement, which sparked just the gospel movement through generations and generations, for that movement, he wrote this song called A Mighty Fortress. It's just an anthem for that, and it echoes the truth that we hear in Psalm 46, that God is our fortress, that he is our rock, that he will never fail. And so as we sing those words together, let's remember that truth and let's worship him for it.
try to destroy us, Lord, we are safe with you. Lord, in you we find salvation and redemption and cause for hope, God. God, that in the silence and in the waiting, we have no doubt. There's no doubt of your goodness, Lord, of your generosity, of your faithfulness. I pray that as we hear your word spoken, 
we would view it through the lens of you being that good and generous God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You all can have a seat. Morning, church. How's everyone today? All right. Well, it's so good to gather around the gospel with you all on this Sunday. It is the final day of Pastor Appreciation Month. And so because of that, we are going to pray together in our time of corporate prayer from Luke 10 2 as we honor the Oldham family and how God has used them here at August. So let me welcome up Noah and Heather Oldham. Give them a round of applause. Man, Noah, Heather, we love you guys so much. It has been such a joy to be your friends and to be pastored by you. And man, just so excited to just pray together as God's people today from Luke 10 If you guys don't, don't know, Luke 10 encapsulates Pastor Noah's call and vision to plant this church. Right, It's kind of what our name means. It's a play on words meaning harvest the city of St. Louis. It comes right from Luke 10. It's Pastor Noah's license play, right? This is your verse. And so, church, we are going to have a conversation with God together this morning from that verse. Here's what it says, Luke 10, 2. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So that's the first thing that Jesus says, right? The harvest is plentiful. We have seen that at August Gate. And so church, we're gonna first just take some time to thank the Lord for how you have seen his harvest over the past 14 years at August Gate. No matter how long you have been here, just take a moment to thank God for how you have seen him work. Just say, Lord, thank you for how I've seen you work by, and then just fill in the blank. Take a moment to thank the Lord for how you've seen him work and harvest here at August Gate. Go ahead and do that. Lord, I thank you for how I have seen you work at August Gate. You have saved sinners. You have brought people from death to life. God, we've seen so many children be born and dedicated to you and now even be baptized. They've gone from death to life. They've begun to follow you. God, we have seen people sent out to plant churches all over St. Louis and even all over North America and all over the world. We've seen marriages reconciled. We've seen the saints equipped to do the work of ministry. Lord, we thank you for how we have seen you work here at August Gate. And then church, just take a moment to ask God for more. We've thanked him for how we've seen him work. And now let's just take a minute to ask him to continue to work. Say, Lord, would you continue to work? Would you continue to build your harvest here? And then fill in the blank. Take a moment to ask God to do even more. Father, we thank you for all the powerful ways that you have worked, Lord, and we ask for more. God, when we see you moving, the only response is to ask you to continue to do the things that you are doing and to praise you for them. So, Lord, we ask that you would save even more sinners, that you would help us more and more to reach our community around us and to reach the ends of the earth, to send out more people to plant churches to raise up more mature disciples who know Jesus, who love Jesus, who follow Jesus. So Lord, we just pray that you would work more and more. We ask this in the name of Jesus. And so Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but then he says the laborers are few. And so church, what I wanna do now is just take a moment to thank God for the Oldham family. 
Spend a moment to thank him that when the laborers were so few, they said yes to plant this church here in St. Louis. So let's take a moment to thank God for the Oldham family, for how they have impacted you, for their faith, for their obedience, for their courage. Take a moment before God to thank him for the Oldham family. Father, thank you for my brother and my sister, for Heather and for Noah. Thank you for their friendship. Thank you that because of my friendship with them, because of their ministry in my life, I'm a better man, I'm a better husband, I'm a better father, I'm a better pastor. God, I thank you for all the ways they have poured into me and poured into this church. God, thank you for their courage, for their faith, to see you calling them here to St. Louis to plant this church. And thank you that they just said, yes, Lord, we will do it. I thank you for all the ways that they have sacrificed, not just them, but their whole family. Thank you for all of their kids. Thank you for bringing many of them from death to life, even through the ministry of this church and of them as parents. So Father, thank you so much for this family. We are so blessed by them. And finally, Jesus says, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so church, finally, let's just take a moment to ask God to continue to raise up laborers, to send out into his harvest. Go ahead and take a minute. Pray that God would send people out into the harvest. Take a moment to pray for Heather and Noah specifically as they prepare at the end of this year to be sent to Atlanta to continue to raise up people to plant churches, pray that the Lord would use them in mighty, powerful ways to raise up more families to plant churches all over North America. And then finally, church, ask the Lord to send you to send you into his harvest. I invite you to simply to pray, Lord, send me. Send me into your harvest wherever you would lead me. Use me to make more disciples of Jesus. I invite you to to, to pray that, to commit that to the Lord. Say, Lord, send me into your harvest. If you don't have the faith to believe that this morning, ask God to give it to you, to believe that he wants to use you and send you into the harvest. Take a moment, just pray, Lord, send me. Well, Father, I just thank you again for the Oldham family, for the life of our church, that they have modeled this for us, what it looks like to live sent out as laborers into the harvest. So, Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would continue to send us out. Send us to our neighborhoods, send us to our schools, send us to our workplaces with the message of the gospel to go into your harvest. You have said it's plentiful. So, Lord, would you raise us up to go? Would you even raise us up to go to the ends of the earth where people have not yet heard the gospel, the only way that they can be saved? So Jesus, I pray for each and every follower of you in this room that you would give us the faith to say, Lord, send me. I will be part of the harvest. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, church, let's give the Oldhams one more round of applause. Well, good morning, church. Thank you for praying with us and praying for us. Now, if you have a Bible, I invite you to open it to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. This morning, as we began worship, hopefully you uh, heard we sang A Mighty Fortress. A couple days from now, many of you are going to get dressed up in all kinds of uh, costumes and go house to house and beg your neighbors to give you free food, right? It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, But October 31st is not just All Hallows' Eve. Uh, the day before All Saints Day, it's actually Reformation Day. It's the day, I believe, 506 years ago where Martin Luther, he wrote his 95 theses and he nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg Church and he declared, no longer will we live our Christian lives in superstition and godlessness, but we will make Jesus and his glory and the word of God everything. And uh, from that day forward, the church began to march 
uh, toward a better day of following Jesus and seeing the world reached with the gospel. We are products of that today. And we have the opportunity to open God's word because that day happened. So this week when you're in your Reese's peanut butter cup coma, just remember, hey, Martin Luther, uh, he did something really great that day and we benefit from it. And this morning we sang, it probably didn't sound the same, but he wrote that song 500 years ago and people in this movement of the gospel have been singing it ever since. So really cool opportunity we had. Um, if you would, pray with me. We're going to dive in and thank God for his word and the opportunity to sit under it. Father, we are so thankful uh, that you are a glorious God who superintends your gospel throughout the ages. Uh, the church is go, always going through seasons of being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And there's all kinds of sin and brokenness that affects the church. But Jesus, you continue to come and purify your church And God, even while there's a bunch of chaos going on today, even in your church, God, you are continuing to purify it. I pray that that purification would happen this morning as we sit underneath your word, that we would say, and we'd be doing the supernatural work of saying, God, transform us by your grace. The Holy Spirit breathed out these words through human authors and then superintended it today. And then today, as we sit under it, it will be breathed into our hearts by the same Holy Spirit. I pray we would be transformed, that we would know Jesus and Love Jesus and follow Jesus together by his grace. So help us now to be students of your word, but more than anything, Lord God, to know, love, and follow you as we embark on sitting under your scriptures. It's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, the date was October 26, 2001. I was a freshman at McKendree College over in Lebanon, Illinois, living on the third floor of Baker Hall a floor in a residence hall that was home to mostly freshman football players, so you can believe it probably smelled great, right? Um, But I was hurt, having developed a bilateral hernia during two days just two months prior. We were all living in the aftermath of 9-11. Maybe you remember those days. Depending on where you found yourself in life, emotions, patriotism, and spiritual fervor were at an all-time high. I had come to college a fairly new Christian. I had surrendered to Jesus Just two summers before, in July of 2000, at Camp Oxford in Rudiment, Illinois. Y'all don't know where Rudiment's at. But I came to college to play football and to study medicine, but I also came to see God move among college students. And I knew that God was up to something, as one of the very first people that I met on campus my first day was a man named Mark Sikma. He was a senior who led all campus ministries, including chapel and FCA. He was also a quarterback on the football team and was the one assigned to take 40-yard dash times at our first practice. Little did I know that when I filled out my freshman profile a few months before and I said that I loved Jesus, he had seen it. He'd been praying for me all summer and he was waiting to introduce himself to me. Well, Mark went on to disciple me that entire year, and then a year or so after graduating, when God began to call us toward church planting, he was the first person I would call, and he would invite me eventually to come do a residency at his church, and his church, Matthias's Lot in St. Charles, would be the sending church for August Gates, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It's October 26, 2001. I can't practice, I can't work out, but I'm fired up for Jesus, and I've got a meeting with a professor. Now, she's exactly what you might imagine as an atheist anthropology professor at a small liberal arts college. Just get a picture in your mind, that's probably her. She had made it abundantly clear our first few weeks of class that she thought Christianity and the Bible's claims were nothing but fairy tales. When others saw an intimidating force to appease so they could just get through the class with a decent grade, I saw a challenge. And so on this mild, sunny October morning, I set a one-on-one meeting. I had grown up in a church with tremendous Bible teaching and equipping that was unrivaled, especially for high school students. So in my short time as a follower of Jesus, I had already been training in classical apologetics. So there I am in my professor's office. I'm walking through every apologetic for the existence of God and the veracity of Scripture and the reality of Christ's resurrection from the dead, and something happened that day. No, Dr. Troop didn't get saved. I'm not sure she even took me seriously but something came alive in my heart. I got back to my dorm room. I turned on my new Dell computer with a a huge four gigs of hard drive, right? Most of it was now full of viruses from Napster, downloading music, right? I I connected to the blazing fast T1 line. Can I get an amen? Remember those days? And I began composing an email to my mom. Line by line, I explained the experience to her, what it was like to share the gospel of my professor, 
the arguments I had used and how I think I planted good seeds that just maybe will bear the fruit of salvation in the days to come. And then I got to this line. I I was planning to type the words, I just want to tell people about Jesus, but all I got out were, I just want to tell. And the Spirit of God showed up in my dorm room in an experience like I had never had and never have had really since. Yeah, I I grew up charismatic, and I had seen God do some powerful things, but I had also seen a lot of hysteria stirred up by human emotion. This wasn't that. Instead, in those next minutes, 20 maybe, the best way to describe it is that God showed me his plan for my life. Those words I just typed went from visible on a screen to audible in my brain. I just want to tell. I just want to tell. I just want to tell. And God told me, that's what you're going to do. You were going to spend the rest of your life telling others about me. I felt this deep sense of godly sorrow as I recognized and repented of the fact that up to that point in my walk with Jesus, I hadn't once asked him what his plans were for my life. Instead, I was choosing the path of greatest gain, a college football, studying medicine. I was going to be a doctor, make lots of money, and live healthy, wealthy, and wise. But God had other plans. And now that I could see them, all I wanted to do was weep and repent of my self-centeredness. But God comforted me in my grief, and just like it came, the moment passed. So I sat up and finished my email to my mom. You are not going to believe what just happened. Well, I underestimated her faith. She did believe what happened, and without me knowing it, she had told all of my pastors. And so when I came home at Christmas and then spring break and eventually summer break, My pastors were ready to take me under their wing and disciple me towards the call that God had in my life. Now, I'm sharing this story with you at this moment for a very specific reason, not for what happened then, but what would happen a couple of years from that moment and how it relates to our text today. Back to Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. The church in Colossae wasn't planted by Paul. Instead, during his third missionary journey, he stopped off in a city called Ephesus for about a period of three years. During this time, a man named Epaphras visited Ephesus, which was a commercial and cultural center of Asia Minor, right there on the coast. Epaphras gets saved, and he takes the gospel back 120 miles to Colossae, where he shares it, and he plants a church. During this time, a man named Philemon gets saved. He's a wealthy man with a large home, and he eventually opens it up to house the gathering of the church there in Colossae. Now, Philemon is married to a gal named Aphia, and together they have a son named Archippus. We know this because of the opening verses of Paul's letter to Philemon that he writes at the exact same time as this letter to the Colossians, and they're delivered by the same men at the same time on the same trip. Well, in his letter to the Colossians, which he writes from prison in Rome, some five to seven years after the church is planted, he takes on some really big subjects. He takes on Christology. It's probably the most dense account of biblical Christology we have anywhere in all of Scripture right there in Colossians chapter 1. He takes on false teaching and new life in Christ and how it applies to all these different realms of our life. And then we come to the end of the letter. Look with me there and Colossians chapter 4, the the section that gets labeled final greetings in our Bible. And I I love these sections because most of the time we're reading through the Bible, we've gotten through what we think is like, this is the meat of the text. And we get here to the end and we're like, I can't pronounce those names anyway. And so we just breeze through it, right? But if we slow down and we read and we pay attention to what's being said, there's so much for us to glean. So let's see what it says. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. It says, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who's one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. 
Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And oh, 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 one more thing, verse 17, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. How Have you ever had someone say something to you, maybe something so, so simple that changed your life? I mean, it's, it's it felt so simple, and it was so mundane, and it took so little time. But the words that were spoken into your life changed your life. You see, I think we're witnessing one of those moments right here at the end of Colossians chapter 4 in what feels like a last-second shout-out to a guy we know very little about. And friends, I believe that right now in this season, in this church, God wants to use this one verse to do the same thing. I think God wants to change someone's life, probably someone's lives, a lot of people, by hearing this one verse and receiving it today. Now, the key to understanding the fullness of this verse and the commands therein is understanding the actual structure of the verse. You see, for readability, because Greek and English grammar and syntax are different, we often change the structure of the sentence so that we can have it flow a little easier. So for readability, our English translations say something to the effect of, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. But in the Greek, see is the first word of the sentence, and fulfill is the last word in the sentence. So it reads more like this, see the ministry that you have received in the Lord and fulfill it. So understanding that, here's the big idea I want us to hear today. The Lord has given a ministry to you. The Lord has a ministry for you. You have to see it so you can truly receive it in order to fulfill it. The Lord has a ministry for you, Christian, but you have to see it so you can truly receive it in order to fulfill it. Now, I want to break that down piece by piece. First, here's what each and every Christian in the room needs to hear. Before anything else, God has a ministry for you. God has a ministry for you. And yes, I mean you. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you have gone from death to life, if you have put your faith in Christ, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how, how able-bodied you are, you have a ministry given to you from the Lord. You see, this concept may be foreign to us because we've taken the word ministry and we've turned it into something that you do only if you have this unique, specific, special call like that of being a pastor or a missionary to a foreign country. But let's be reminded of what the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, he says, speaking to all Christians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we, we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What Paul says is we have been saved by grace through faith, for good works. That you and I were created and then recreated at salvation for good works that he planned before we were even created. He says, I've got a purpose and a plan and a mission for every person, and I'm going to save them toward that purpose. That's why anytime I do a baptism interview with someone who has said, I'm ready <coughs> to follow Christ, I've trusted in the finished work of Christ on the cross and in the empty tomb to forgive my sins and give me new life. And I'm prepared to follow him with my whole life for the rest of my life. The very next thing I tell them is I want you to begin thinking about the ministry that God has given you. You see, this word ministry is simply the word diakonia. It's a Greek word we see all over the New Testament. It's the word we get deacon from. It simply means to execute the commands of another. To execute the commands of another. And it's often translated not only as ministry, but as the word service. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. It says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
And there are varieties of service, ministry, diaconia, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 for us. Three things. First, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to every Christian, even you. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to every Christian, including you. The Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in the life of a Christian when they put their faith in Christ. And when he does, he brings with him, Ephesians 4 tells us, spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is now working inside of you, transforming you, adding to your power and ability to follow Christ and be used in his mission. Every single believer has gifts given them by God. Now, they may be lying dormant. They may be undeveloped, but they're there. Secondly, these gifts are to be used to serve Christ and his church. These gifts are to be used to serve Christ and his church. They're to glorify Jesus. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and he will glorify me, Jesus. He'll, he will tell the world about Christ. And the tool that God uses to make that mission accomplished is the local church. So these gifts are to be used to serve Christ and his church. And then thirdly, this ministry will have unique effects as it comes through you as a unique individual. You notice he says there's different gifts, different ministry, and he uses a, a last phrase there, and it means effects. And what, what this means is there's different gifts that they're going to manifest in different ministries, but each ministry is going to be different because each individual that has those gifts and works that ministry is different. And so if you and I have the same gifts and we do the same ministry, it's going to look very different because we're different people, and God does it all on purpose. You've been given a ministry, but what do you have to do? Well, he tells us here in Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, first, you have to see your ministry. You have to see it. The very beginning of the command is see this ministry. Well, how do you do that? Well, a few ways. First, you need to look to Scripture. We need to look to Scripture. There are several lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. There's Romans chapter 12, 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. And then 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Each of these lists are different, and none of them are meant to be conclusive. In fact, these are just <clears throat> examples of what spiritual gifts look like in our lives. Some of them are categories. Some of them are more specific than others. But it's a general list of this is what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you for the glory of Jesus and the building up of the church. None of them are meant to be Conclusive. First, we have to look to Scripture to get an idea of what does this look like. Secondly, we need to prayerfully ask questions. If you want to see what your ministry is, what God has placed in you and is placed in front of you, you need to prayerfully ask questions. Ask, for instance, where has the Lord placed me? Acts 17 says the Lord sovereignly defines our borders, our boundaries, and our seasons. Meaning that God has placed you where he's placed you, when he's placed you, for a reason. I love having a church with so many people that have been or are currently in the military because uh, the military that you often think that Uncle Sam moves you around, right? Uncle Sam, I'm here because Uncle Sam moved me here. I'll go there when they give me orders to go there. Uncle Sam is not sending you where he's sending you. God is sending you. Now, he may use Uncle Sam to foot the bill, but God is the one who sovereignly places where you're at, when you're at for a purpose. And so you have to ask the question, why does God have me here? Where does he have you, including and especially which local church? After you've answered that question, then you need to ask, what are the needs according to the mission and vision of my church? What are the needs according to the mission and vision of my church? See, God brings you to a church to be a member. Now, when you think member, don't think like the YMCA or, or club fitness, right? You pay your 10 bucks, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, club fitness, right? Uh, better fitness, better life. And then you show up if you want to and you don't if you don't want to. That's not what it means. It's, it's, not, it's not a gym, it's a body. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, we are members of the same body. It's a human body. Think body parts. All of them are needed and all of them are purposeful so long as they function as a part of the body and the right and purposeful aim of being a body. You know, anytime we have a part of our body that 
isn't a part of the body and doesn't act like a part of the body, you know what we call that? Cancer, and we cut it out. And so if you are in the body but not acting as a part of the body, you have to ask, I need to be a member or, or I, I, maybe I'm not part of the body to begin with. 1 Corinthians 12, 17 says that this is given for the common good, meaning that my gifts are not just for me and your gifts aren't just for you, they're for everyone else too. That God gives us all gifts to better the people around us and further the purpose of Christ in us and through us. And then we need to ask, what am I naturally talented at? What am I naturally talented at? Ephesians 2 says that God created you. You're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he predestined that you would walk in them, meaning that before you were even physically made, he had a plan for how he's going to use you. So he made you according to that plan. And then at salvation, he remakes you and puts new stuff in you. What are you talented at? God's placed that in you. Then you need to ask, in, in what different ways can these gifts be used in this church? You know, because we may feel like we have gifts, but they're not, they're not meant to be used in this church in this season. And we get frustrated with that, or we can say, what gifts do I have, and how might those be used in this church right now? And then we need to ask, in what ways can these gifts be used to further God's kingdom activity beyond this church? One of the glorious realities of being a gospel-centered missional church is that what we do on Sunday isn't the fulfillment of being his church. We gather together that we might be sent and scattered, and God puts gifts among his people so that the mission of the gospel can move forward. If you, maybe you're here and you're like, I don't know where I fit. It's probably not in a Sunday service. It might be out in the week leading the mission of God forward into new spheres. We have to ask all these questions prayerfully. But after we do that, we also need to humbly ask others. Humbly ask others. You need to ask trusted friends, what are my gifts? Now, clarification here on what a trusted friend is. A trusted friend is neither a foe nor a fan. They're not a foe and they're not a fan. They love you, but they're not impressed by you. Meaning that you need someone to tell you the truth, not just what you want to hear. For instance, somebody needed to tell most of the folks trying out for American Idol, you can't sing, right? <laughs> They have nobody in their life that loves them enough to say, this is not your gift. Why would you go on TV and prove to the world it's not your gift? We need friends in the church to be like, hey, that's not your gift, but this is. And let me help you find how you can use that gift. So beyond asking trusted friends, you need to ask your pastors and leaders, where are the holes? Where can I make the biggest impact? Recently had one of our deacons in for a meeting and I drew on the board, we have an area of ministry just stacked with people. We actually have too many people to actually use them in a, in a, a powerful way, an impactful way. And then I, we, we talked about three or four holes in the church. I said, if these people would all say, even though I love this ministry, I'm going to give that up to go do one of those things, the holes are all filled and everybody's being used at a greater level. It's that kind of a thing. Where are the holes? Where can I best be an impact for God's kingdom? You see, Ephesians 4 says that God gives the leaders in the church not to do the ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And our job as overseers is to look and to say, how do we help people direct and redirect to where they're using their gifts for maximum impact in God's glory? Sometimes, like this archipus moment here, these answers come from leaders without us even asking. There have been times in the life of our church, even outside of our church, where I reach out to people and I just say, hey, I see this in you. You should consider it. In fact, that's Raiden Hollis's story at Red Hill Church in Edwardsville. Years ago, he was a pastor at a church in southwest Missouri, and Pastor Kevin introduced us, and we were just mutual acquaintances. I'd see him once a year at the Baptist Convention in Missouri somewhere. And then one year, I grabbed him, and I, and I asked him, hey, have you ever considered planting a church? I think you should, and I know exactly where. And little did I know that a year later, he would be gathering a core team up in Edwardsville, Illinois. And now they're celebrating like six, seven years of gospel ministry there. You know where I got that? I got that from my own experience. There I am, home from college on a Wednesday night, spending all my time serving with my youth pastor. I'm 20 years old. Remember, I've received this call from God to tell others about Jesus. I'm doing my best to see that happen. And one of my pastors, his name's Barry Steed, 
He's preaching on Wednesday night. That was always his, his time of the week to preach. And uh, he was like a fiery evangelistic kind of guy. Um, and he's in the middle of a point, pacing back and forth across the stage, preaching. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just stops and he looks at me, midpoint. He says, Noah Oldham, God is not calling you to be a youth pastor. And then goes right back to preaching. And I'm like, looking around, did that happen? And I'm making sure I didn't hallucinate that. I did grow up in a charismatic church, just making sure. Y'all saw that too, right? Let me tell you what was really awkward was that a little over a year later when my youth pastor moved to Kansas City and my elders called me and said, hey, we want you to take his spot. We want you to be our next youth pastor. I'm like, oh, this is awkward, right? But here's what I came to find out later when I talked to Barry about it. What he was saying was, you can do youth ministry, but I don't think God has called you to do this youth ministry long term. And that leads us to number two. Not only do we have to see our ministry, but secondly, we have to receive our ministry. You have to receive your ministry, Paul tells Archippus. The word that Paul uses here in Colossians 4.17 means to accept and acknowledge. To accept it, to acknowledge it, to say this is true. Now, our accepting and our acknowledging has two challenges. First, the first challenge is pride. The first challenge to us receiving our ministry is pride. In the rest of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul goes on this long explanation about not minimizing some of the gifts and maximizing the others. Why does he have to do that? Because that's what's happening. And it happens in every church if we're not careful. We minimize some gifts and we maximize the others. These are the important things and these, eh, not so much. And Paul says, you can't do that. And he uses a metaphor of the physical body. And he tells us that every member matters. And he does this for two reasons. First, because in the church, we can minimize the value of others. We can minimize the need and the necessity of others using their gifts. That their gifts aren't as important as mine. And we elevate ourselves in pride. But another deadly effect of pride is minimizing our own gifts, our own ministry, so that we don't receive it. Meaning... We can view the gifts that God has given us as less important in the kingdom scheme of things, and therefore we never embrace them because we think that they're below us. We have an image of what greatness is in the kingdom of God and say, I want that, and I can't have that, and I don't want nothing. It's pride. And we miss out what is truly great, which is following in God's path to accomplish the good works that he has predestined we would walk in according to the way he's made us in the timing that he's placed us we have to push pride to the curb. We had to stop saying, I don't want to, I don't want to do this, I want to do that. But the second challenge is similar to pride. It's false humility. We often can't embrace or accept our ministry because of false humility. Now, Paul doesn't want us to minimize any gift in the body, but to see it as vital so that we don't talk ourselves out of using our God-given necessary gift out of this sense of false humility. Oh, my gift isn't as important as theirs. It's really important that the preacher preaches, but does it really matter if I don't use my gifts? Would anyone really notice? Yes, God would notice. And he would look at a church and say they are not as effective as they could be because only a few people are using their gifts. What if the entire body is using their gifts? Now it takes all kinds of strategy to make that work, all kinds of relational stuff to get people to work together, not step on each other's toes and to do it in love and not jockey for position, but it's possible. And when we do it according to his spirit, the church takes off. It's effective for God's glory. So you have to see your ministry and then you have to receive your ministry. But there's a third piece that Paul tells Archippus here in 417. He says, you have to fulfill your ministry. See your ministry in such a way, receive it in such a way that you fulfill it. It's not enough to just see it, nor is it enough to step further and receive it. Paul tells Archippus, see it and receive it and fulfill it. And this word fulfill means to render full, to carry into full effect. For us to carry our God-given ministry into full effect, there are a few things we have to be ready to do. First, we have to qualify for it. We have to be ready to qualify for it. Back in 2006, when God began calling Heather and I to plant a church, I started looking up church planting networks. I knew nothing about planting a church. So I started Googling the phrase, and I found a network. Remember, I had no real denominational affiliation back in those days. I was a spiritual mutt. I got saved at 17 and went to college. 
And so I applied for the one that I thought I most aligned with. In early 2007, I'm in the midst of this chaos I described to you guys a few weeks ago, and I'm filling out the paperwork. I'm doing the online assessment, and after all that's done, I get a call back. They said, hey, we think you're called to plant a church, but at this point, you are the youngest candidate we've ever had. I was 24 years old, 24 years old. I was young. I didn't feel young, right? But I was. I still had a faux hawk, all right? It could only grow a goatee. Oh, look how I've grown, right? And what they said in that moment was, uh, hey, we, we think you're called to plant a church. Here's what we want to do. We want you to come to the journey over in St. Louis. We want you to do a year-long residency. We think that after that time and that experience, you'll be ready. And when I heard that, you know what? Something just bowed up inside of me. I had gifts. I had a calling. I had ministry that I had received from the Lord. They don't know me. And so I said, no. You know what happened? I was right. They didn't know me. I not only needed time and experience, but I needed a few other things in order to be ready to plant a church. And so instead of a one-year timeline, God took me on two. Yeah. But here's the point. It's easy to say, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. It's a lot harder to believe that and then be willing to walk through the season of qualification necessary. There are folks in this church, listen to me, friends, that God has called and that calling is fresh. And right now, maybe that qualification is long. The worst thing you can do is reject the season of qualification and the growth that comes from it. If that is you, I want you to think of the life of our patriarch, Jacob. His name was Jacob, which meant trickster, a name that fit him well early in life. But God had bigger plans. So God takes him on this years-long journey away from home, and, and he goes through a long season of qualification under the poor leadership of his uncle Laban. But there's more to that story. One night, as he's about to step back into his old life and pick up where he left off, he's all alone. And God shows up in human form and wrestles with him all night long. Like physically, hand-to-hand -hand combat, God is wrestling with Jacob. And it looks like it just takes hours. What is going on? Jacob's really strong. No, it took one moment, one touch from God to his hip, and he is dislocated and he's maimed the rest of his life. The Bible goes on to say that from that day forward, Jacob walked with a limp. From that day forward, he never walked the same. You know what, friend? Your period of qualification might be hard. It might be strenuous and really not a lot of fun. Your season of qualification might feel like you're wrestling with God. God is just not giving you what you want, when you want it, how you want it. But at the time, it may feel like God is injuring you even. But know this, when he does you will never be the same. A lot of times God isn't really ready to use you until your walk looks different. So don't despise the season of wrestle and qualification. It's often during those times that we have the greatest opportunity for intimacy with God because in the wrestle, he's got his hands all over you and he's shaping you and he's molding you so he can use you for greater purposes. Though not only did he walk different after that day, the Bible says that God changed his name. You're no longer Jacob the trickster. You're now Israel. He strives with God and men. God changed him in a moment, in a season of qualification. Friends, he'll do the same in us. Cooperate with him. The ministry fruit will never be as mature or sweet as if it will be if you wait on the Lord and develop under his perfect timing. Qualify for it. Secondly, if we want to fulfill the ministry God's given us, we need to sacrifice for it. Here's what I'll say about this. I know a guy who wants a truck. It is a big truck, a beautiful truck, a black truck, a chrome truck. It's an amazing truck. Some of you men know the truck I'm talking about, right? And he can have this truck right now, easy. All he'd have to do is stop tithing. But you know what he wants more than that truck? To honor the Lord and put the Lord first and seek first the kingdom and fulfill the ministry he's received in the Lord? The point is this. If he has given you a ministry, and he has, and you see it, which you should, and you receive it, which you ought to, you have to be ready to sacrifice in order to fulfill it. You have to be ready to say, 
Other things will have to be second, so this can be first. Too many people, see, get to this point in the process and they give up. Think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, all of these other things I've done, what else must I do? And Jesus looks at this man knowing his heart and he sees the thing that he loves most and he said, sell it all. Sell it all, give it to the poor and then come follow me. And it says the man went away sad. Why? Because his wealth was great. In other words, what Jesus required of him was too great in comparison to his desire to follow Christ. Friends, Jesus probably isn't calling you or I to sell it all and give to the poor because that's probably not our greatest love. But you have some other great loves in your life. And in order for Jesus to be ultimate and in order for him to use you the way he desires, that ministry, that call has got to be ultimate. You've got to be ready to sacrifice for it. And then finally, if we want to see this ministry fulfilled, we want to fulfill it. We have to persevere in it. We have to persevere in it. I shared a few weeks ago that we used to affectionately call 2007 the year from hell. What a great title for a year, right? Can you imagine the the photo photo, uh, thing we're going to have one day? We just show that at one of our kids' uh, weddings or something. 2007, the year from hell. Until we realized what God was truly up to. That didn't make it any less hard. It just made it more purposeful. But a few months after moving our lives from our hometown and our home church to the St. Louis suburbs to follow a call to plant a church, a call that would eventually take us down to South Florida for a year before coming back to do a residency at our eventual sending church, a few months into buying a house right before the housing market crashed, a few months into coming on staff at a church as a church planning resident, things were falling apart. Three days after signing our lives away on a mortgage for a new house. Three days, oh, the timing. Three days, the leadership team of this church that had called us to come, uh, they met and they said, hey, lead pastor, you've gotten out in front of your skis. We're not gonna plant a church anytime soon. To which Heather and I are like, what, what, what? They said, yeah, and, and, and looking at the budget, we really don't have the money to pay him what we promised we're gonna pay him. So here, here, after you left your church and you followed God's call to come plant a church, you're going to be our youth pastor for the foreseeable future, and we're going to pay you 75% what we promised you. Now you cannot afford that house anymore. You're going to figure it out. Hey, if we grow, you'll get paid more, and maybe we'll plant a church one day. Well, that was just the tip of the iceberg of poor communication and failed promises. And so after a series of very hard conversations, just a few months after moving here, I was meeting with the lead pastor at Cracker Barrel, and he was sliding an NDA across the table. Sign it and you'll get severance. So I'm now jobless and no one's hiring. And very soon we're gonna be homeless because we can't afford to pay this mortgage and we have to rent it out. So my in-laws invite us to come to South Florida. They'll help me find a job. They'll help us figure it out. Got to call me to plant a church in St. Louis and I'm here. I'm, I'm so close. I'm in Jefferson County. Like I can smell Anheuser-Busch from there on a clear day, right? And now God's calling me to to move a thousand miles in the other direction. God, what are you doing? And then I got a phone call. It was my uncle Mike, Uh, Mike Oldham, like he always says, he always says both names. Mike Oldham is uh, my dad's younger brother. He's one of the most precious dudes you'll ever meet. He lived a really hard life apart from Jesus for most of his life and then he got saved. And when he did, he became one of the biggest encouragers in the world. Well, he heard what was going on, and though he didn't have any sort of seminary training or leadership acumen, dude washed windows every day of his life, busted his back, literally, to make a living. He called me up, and he simply said one thing, Bubby, he always called me Bubby my whole life, Bubby, don't give up, don't give up. And I said, Uncle Mike, I got nothing but the call. How could I give up? A little over two years later, when August Gate was launching at Trinity Schoolhouse down in Soulard, where Anheuser-Busch was, I could smell two years before on a clear day. My dad came in uh, to celebrate with us. And when I hugged him before the service started, I thought of Uncle Mike. Bubby, don't give up. 
Friends, the Lord has a ministry for you. He really does. You have to see it so that you can truly receive it in order to fulfill it. Your life is long. And I know that right now, it takes so much to get our hearts to believe that God would even do something in our lives. But Ephesians chapter three says that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. So that thing that you can't even, I, that can't be what God wants to do. There's no way God would use my life like that. He says, I can do more than that. If you just believe, you just trust me, you just follow my call for your life. You begin with a simple surrender that says, God, here I am. And then when you see the ministry and you receive the ministry, he says, I will help you fulfill it. I will bring it to pass in your life. In this next season of the life of our church, I think God is looking for men and women, even boys and girls, to hear the call of Archippus in 417. I say, okay, Lord, okay, okay. So I have three questions for us to consider as we get ready to move into a time of response. Three questions that I hope that you will embrace because you never know, 20 some odd years from now, you may be telling other people a similar story that there was this message where my pastor read one simple verse and it changed the trajectory of my life. The word of God can do that. So three questions I hope you'll engage with. Number one is this, are you fulfilling the ministry you have received in the Lord? Are you? Do you see it? Have you received it? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill it? If not, why not? If you're not, why not? Is it because you need to see what it is? You need help to take this first step we talked about of asking the questions and searching the scripture and saying, okay, God, I need to go to my leaders and say, where's the hole? Where can I be used? Where can I try? Is you need to receive it, that you, you, you think you know, but you're either through pride or false humility, unwilling to take the step. Or is it just simply a matter of now trusting the Lord and walking in steps to fulfill it, to sacrifice for it and qualify for it and persevere in it? And so question number three is where it truly begins. What's your first step? What's your first step? This may take a hundred steps, but I'm not worried about the other 99. I'm just worried about the one. Obedience is about the one in front of you. The first step that God is calling you to take that's why when someone gets saved, Jesus says it's time to be baptized. And somebody's like, I don't know if I want to be baptized. And I don't know if you want to follow Jesus. Why? Because he's told you to do one thing and you don't want to do that. It's about the one thing in front of you. What's the first step? Maybe it's repentance today. Repenting of pride or false humility. Maybe it's, I need to search the scriptures. I need to meet with the pastor. I need to talk to my small group. I need to ask a, a friend, hey, help me see this rightly. What is your first step? That's all God is calling you to be responsible for this morning. And when you take that, he'll give you another and then another. I want to specifically challenge young, young adults and teenagers. You are in a season of life. It's even more than it was when I was in college and high school 25 years ago where you're already making decisions as a teenager like 14, 15, 16 years old. You're taking tests, you're filling out applications, you're searching for scholarships, you're making plans for the rest of your life, and you're like me, you never even ask God what he wants to do. And we got some amazing teenagers and young adults in our church, like really great. And you can make some really great decisions to do some really cool things. But what if God has something just a little bit different for you, and he's waiting for you to come to him and say, oh God, what is it? let you do your thing if you want to do your thing, but I'd rather you do my thing. Let me challenge you to do that even today as you, as you receive Colossians 4, 17. Lord, what is it? What's the call you have for my life? I want that more than anything else. You know, I told you I went to college to be a doctor. Both of my brothers are now doctors, both of them. Think about how Christmas feels, right? Doctor, doctor, pastor, right? One day I'll finish that doctorate. But I often think about what could have been. What could have been? If that day and the Lord said, this is what I want you to do, I was like, nah, medicine sounds great. What could have been? 
What I could have missed out on the glorious life that God has allowed me to live just these 20 years. He's got so much more by his grace. I want you to consider right now the dreams that are in your heart. Maybe there is something even better, even better than that. And he's waiting for you to say, God, what is it? So he can tell you. I don't think I need to tell you how much I love this church. It's not about an organization, it's about these people. And God's gonna do some great things in all of y'all's life, together and individually over the next season of life. But I want you to hear from a pastor's heart today. See that you fulfill the ministry you've received in the Lord. Because there's no greater thing. Father, help us. Help us now to hear your word and apply it to our lives. God, that we be a people that are just sold out to your call, sold out to your purposes. You have a dream of what it looks like for your kingdom to come and your will be, to be done in Belleville as it is in heaven, in O'Fallon as it is in heaven, in St. Louis as it is in heaven. You have a dream and you're calling these people for the season you have them here to give everything they have to that purpose here. And when you move them somewhere else, you're gonna do it there. But God, I pray that we would not be so short-sighted and so self-centered that we miss the glorious thing all around us for this mundane thing as we stare at our own belly button. God, give us kingdom vision. Oh, God, and give us faith to grab a hold of your altar and not let go until you show us what you have for us, God. Help us know what step number one is today and then give us grace to obey it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, we're gonna respond to what God has said and what God is saying. I invite you first just to a moment of prayer across the back. We're going to have a couple men and a couple women to pray with you and pray for you. You know, Jesus commands us to gather. His word commands us to not give up meeting together. And he tells us to do a number of things. He says, preach and sing, take the Lord's Supper. But one of the things that he tells us to do together is to pray for one another. Not just pray around one another, pray for one another. And I think that we don't obey that as much as we should and much as we could. So today, especially in this subject, you don't know what to pray for yourself, man. These men and these women, they know how to do that. They train for it. They want to do it. They're prepared for it. Maybe you've got somebody in your small group or your friend or your spouse sitting around you. You said, pray with me. Pray for me. Let's pray together. And let's ask the Lord to help us prayerfully ask and answer these questions. If you have any other prayer needs going on in your life, that team's there for that as well. Maybe you have a surgery coming up. The Bible tells us not only seek medical help, but to pray and ask the Lord to step in and intervene. I want to pray for you. Big decisions coming up. But your heart's just in a tough place. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to move in our lives. After this moment of prayer, we invite all those who trusted in the finished work of Jesus to the table to receive the Lord's Supper, to remember the gospel. We've received a ministry because God has a mission. And we're just saying, Lord, I say yes to your mission. And we're reminded that the mission is given to us by his grace through faith. It's to take the gospel here, there, and everywhere. And it's important today that we take the Lord's Supper and remember what Christ has done because otherwise our ministry can become our means of making ourselves right with God. If I preach good enough, if I sing well enough, if I serve enough hours, fill in the blank with whatever God calls you to do. If I do that well enough, then God will love me. The Lord's Supper is a reminder the work has been done. We don't serve in order to earn his favor. We, we serve because we have received his favor in Christ freely. And our service is our response to that glorious truth. That if you're a Christian, you have been saved by grace through faith, two good works. And the order matters. If you're not yet a Christian, we are so glad you're here. I mean, we're crying out loud. We love the fact that you're here. We plant churches so that you would hear the gospel but I want you to know that you don't have a ministry yet. Step one is not you getting busy for the Lord. It's the Lord transforming your life as you surrender to him. The Bible tells us this amazing promise. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It means you look to him as Lord and Savior. I'm a sinner. 
You died on the cross for my sins. You rose to give a dead person new life. You rule and reign. I surrender to you, God. The Bible tells us anyone who does that will be saved. God is drawing you today. You, right where you're at, you can confess your sins. You can believe on the Lord Jesus. You can become a Christian today. If you need help walking through that, a couple men, a couple women across the back, we would love to walk with you and pray with you in that. I got to do that just last week. Never gets old. Let's do it. But not only that, if you make that decision today, we want to walk with you. We want to take these next steps in this journey for the rest of your life in following Christ. You're going to find out at August Gate, we don't like wearing masks. We don't like a lot of pretense. Surprise, we know you're a sinner because we all are. And we are seeking to grow to know, love, and follow him together by his grace. We want to invite you into that. After we take the Lord's Supper, we also have the opportunity to respond through giving. We believe the gospel is so good, it is so beautiful, it is worth sacrificing for. And so we give back to God out of what he's given us so that the gospel is heralded not only in this region, but to the ends of the earth. God takes our financial gifts. He sets them ablaze for his glory. And God is doing amazing things all over the earth by our simple obedience. So if you're a Christian, covenant member, regular tender, this is where we join together to be a part of God's kingdom work. And finally, we're going to come back to our seats and lift hearts and hands and voices to worship Jesus. This team does an amazing job of putting anthems in our mouth, words to sing back to God. But I want to invite you not to get in a hurry to just fall in line with what's happening around you. I want you to take time to really pray. And I want you to really sing from your heart. I want you to really take time with the Lord. And so just don't get in a hurry. Let the Lord set your pace as we respond. Father, we thank you for the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And God, I pray that your power be at work in this room this morning. And that God, we would be continually transformed to the image of Jesus and moved in the directions that you have for us in our lives. We ask it in Christ's strong name. Amen.
worship you for who you are, our creator, our designer. We are fearfully and wonderfully made because you have made us. You've given us identity. You've given us purpose. You've given us life. God, as we sing of your faithfulness and your goodness in every season, Lord, help us to remember that we are yours. Nothing can change that. Sing together. Nothing ever grows if it never rains. And sometimes victory still feels like pain. In every season, my God's the same. Say it again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ends.
quick curveball before we leave to, uh, today. Mike, I'm going to invite Mike to come up. Mike Sanders, he and Lori were part of August Gate for a few years before they recently moved. Just, he wants to share just a real encouraging thing, the Lord, just showing him in this season, especially what we heard this morning. And we're going to pray for them uh, before we go today. Just share that. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, for those that don't know, Lori and I were called to move to uh, South Florida. Get that, eat that mic. Get that real close. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and we moved down to Vero Beach, and uh, if you get a chance, Lori is watching right now, too, so say hi. Uh, but we, uh, I came back to uh, coach a little bit uh, as an assistant coach here still, because I was coaching at all top. And uh, the reason was so we could get to the state meet, and we yesterday we managed to qualify, so I'm here for another week. Uh, but Lori, um, I want you to know we were called to come down to Florida to... Uh, to answer a call with her aunt and uh, take care of her and so forth, we have uh, a, a, that that has happened. Uh, she has uh, moved in with us. Lori is very very obedient to the uh, caregiving call. Um, we're so happy to see her aunt getting healthier and, and moving in with us. Uh, the other thing was is 
I, I thought I might coach down in Vero Beach, but that's not happening. You know, God has called me to be an FCA ambassador, so I'm uh, going out traveling to schools and uh, uh, meeting with kids and answering that call as well. But uh, I, I just wanted to share that because, you know, Pastor Noah mentioned about FCA. It is a, a huge blessing to reach out and meet with those kids. Uh, I'd ask for you to pray for us in the aspect that we're actually having a big family Thanksgiving. All our kiddos are coming in to Vero Beach, and uh, we haven't had that in 10, 15 years possibly. Um, but it's going to be an interesting Thanksgiving because we, we have some interesting dynamics. So if you would just pray for us to be open to the joy and the love that God wants us to share with our kiddos and uh, open their hearts possibly. And then finally, a couple other little things. Please pray for Lori and I in the aspect of uh, continuing to find joy in, in answering the call that he has for us in Florida, um, being with family. Um, and then soon for me, um, it's a hard situation, but you know, I, some of you know I had cancer 15 years ago, and the radiation has continued its, its effects in my throat and jaw and everything. Um, probably in the spring, they're going to amputate my jaw partially or fully and um, try and reconstruct it so that I might be able to speak better and eat better. Um, that's going to put some, some struggle or burden on Lori a little bit. Lori is a strong, strong, strong caregiver. And... Uh, I just pray uh, that you know she'll be able to to step in and do that. And then um, finally, uh, that, that Lori and I settle into our new church. We've got a new church called Grace Spring. Um, it's a great little church. Uh, not as wonderful as here. <laughs> <laughs> this is on the internet. Yeah, be careful. Yeah, yeah, I know, but this is a great event. I tell you, I was so fired up this morning hearing the band and loving uh, hearing. Let me, Pastor Noah's message today so edified everything that we're doing down there in Florida. I just, I mean, I've just felt very strong to come here and share with you guys that being obedient to the call that God has for you. I mean, it was a year and a half ago that God called Lori to make this move. And I, I just looked at her and I said, look, if God's calling you, I'll drop my head coach position and we'll go. Because she's called, and you know, she's called me in my Air Force career for so long. And, um, yeah. man, what a what a deal it's been yeah. just to answer that and trust in what he's done. Right. You know, so I wanted to let you guys know, Pastor Noah's message edified everything there. So if you feel that call, man, be obedient. Be yeah. obedient and, and let him love on you and take you through that. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, church. Here's what I want to do. We're going to pray for Mike and Lori, but there's also a couple other uh, prayer things as well. Uh, many of you know um, Vince and Kristen uh, Bissy. They have been in a process of uh, praying about a call to go to uh, Phoenix to lead a church there and recently just confirmed that call. And they're gonna be going here very soon. I don't know where Vince has left the room, but Kristen's over here. Uh, we're gonna, we wanna surround them and pray for them. And also he's gonna kill me for doing this and he's big enough to do it. Um, Corey Suja, back here, one of our covenant members, he's having surgery on his neck and spine, uh, very serious surgery here in November. So just a couple people around there, just put your, put your hand on his back. A couple people surround uh, Vince and Kristen and the Bissy family. And I wanna pray for Mike. Let's take a moment, let's pray just for the needs of the calling and the things we're walking through in this season. Father God, I thank you for, uh, I thank you for Mike and I thank you God for Lori and the work, the walk that you're taking them through in this season. I pray that you would undergird them in the call. I pray that you would bring health to Mike's body and God endurance to Lori and her soul as she cares for him. We pray, thanking you, Lord God, for the busies and the call you have on their life. God, we know that Phoenix is never going to be the same after they arrive there and begin that ministry in that next season. Pray you go before them as you already have, and God, accomplish your good work. And God, finally, we just lift up Corey and his surgery that's coming up here uh, in November. God, we pray your hand be upon him. We pray you bring healing and, God, mobility and quality of life that would increase. God, I pray that not only you be with the doctors, God, you provide for the surgery and the finances. And God, I pray that you would also bring him such a level of health afterwards that he would be able to do not only the things he has to do for his job, but the things he loves to do, Lord God, that he had given him so many opportunities to share the gospel and live on mission. Father, we, we trust you. We put all of our needs in front of you, worshiping you, Lord God, knowing that when we follow the call, you will always match it with faithfulness. So for all those who are suffering right now in this room who didn't mention it or were not 
They're not knowing about it right now, Lord God. I pray that you would have your hand upon them and they would feel this moment that they can trust you, that you're good, and they would run into your arms, Lord God, their strong tower that will not be shaken. And God, I pray for all of us as we consider the call you have for us, that God, we would trust you to take that first step knowing that you're good and you'll meet, meet us with faithfulness. God, thank you for this time. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Derek, where you at, my man? Derek, come and, come and close us down, brother. You guys can have a seat. Thanks, man. Yeah, church, go ahead and take a seat. Uh, I've got a few next steps to invite you guys to take. It's kind of hard to follow all that up, right? Like, <laughs> here's some next steps. After talking about some uh, surgeries that uh, we're needing prayer for and uh, some obedience and, and call. Man, what a blessing. Uh, but bear with me. Uh, we just have a few uh, to encourage you guys to take. The first next step we have is to join us for our Fall Fest on Saturday, November 4th from 1 to 4 p.m. outside in our backyard on the church grounds. What better way to welcome in fall weather than partying with a bunch of friends and family outdoors? Uh, we're going to have pie eating contests. We're going to have a hay ride. We're going to have face painting. Uh, there's going to be crafts and there's going to be family relay races. Uh, for those of you who love you some sweet treats, uh, we're going to have a cookie baking contest. Uh, and if you happen to be a fellow chili lover like I am, uh, we'll also be having a chili cook-off. So throw on your apron and chop up your chilies and bring your family's best of the best to the Fall Fest. Uh, at 2 p.m. today, there's going to be a text message sent out for anybody who is wanting to sign up to be a part of the pie eating contests. Uh, we have one for the AG students, uh, one for the adults. Uh, that need to have registration done for. So there's only 10 slots for each group. So if you're interested in scarfing some serious pie uh, and showing us just how good you are at doing that uh, and you want to win first place in that, you need to make sure to sign up for that. So that text message will be sent out at 2 o'clock with the sign-up sheet. Uh, the pie eating contest for the little kiddos, uh, it's just going to be if you want your kid to get a messy face, you know, have them come on out. We don't care how many there are, if there's five or if there's 50, you know, great. The more the merrier. Uh, we've got plenty of whipped cream. Uh, so if you want to compete in either the chili cook-off or the cookie competition, you also need to register in the August Gate app and let us know that you've done that. If, this is a shameless plug. If you haven't downloaded the August Gate app yet, now would be a really good time to do that. If you need to register for either of those two events, this would be a great way to do it. Uh, also, if you're not planning on competing, Man, just go ahead and register in that app so that we know who is coming and we know to expect, uh, what to expect and what to plan for. Second next step, save the date to honor the Oldhams on Friday, December 8th at 6.30 p.m. We'll meet here at the church building for a night of gratitude and goodbyes as we spend the evening remembering and thanking God for the work that they have accomplished or that God has accomplished through the Oldhams in their 14 years here at August Gate. We'll have a special worship service followed by a time to connect over dessert. So save the date and make plans to join us to honor Noah and Heather. And finally, if you're new to August Gate, we want to connect with you. Whether, you, whether you're brand spanking new to August Gate, uh, and this is week one for you, or if you've been attending for a few weeks now and you just haven't had a chance to get plugged in, this is the, this is the time to do it, man. We'd love to get to know you, and we'd love to get, uh, get you connected to the life of August Gate. One of the best ways to do that is to fill out the connect form. Uh, you can do that by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you or up on the screen. Uh, or you can text the word connect to 618-226-4343. Uh, or if you're like me and your fingers don't jive really well with a really small screen and typing and all that, uh, and you would much rather talk to somebody face to face, crazy, right? Right down the stairs in the foyer, uh, there's somebody in our connection area who is just thrilled and excited and happy to see you and talk to you and get you connected into the life of August Gate. Uh, so once you've filled out that form and you've given us a little bit of information on how we can contact you, we'll be following, following up with you uh, shortly thereafter to see how we can get you connected. All right, ladies and gentlemen, those are all the next steps I have for you today. If you guys would, go ahead and stand with me as we pray to be sent. Heavenly Father, uh, Father, thank you so much for this message this morning that we heard. Uh, thank you for the encouragement and the challenge uh, that we received this morning from the Holy Spirit uh, to recognize our ministry that you have for us, uh, Father, to accept it, and Father, to fulfill it. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, we would take that call and that charge seriously, and we would take it with us uh, in our hearts. We would implement it in our lives. 
Father, we love you so very much, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, go to love, serve, and tell. You are sent.